Okay. <clears throat> um, hope you guys had a good weekend. Uh, was Friday the day when there was like tons of thunder and lightning? Was that? That was cool. You guys like go out. I, I, I live on Capitol Hill, and in my neighborhood, everybody was out, and they're like, "Wow, this is really cool!" And every time there would be like a huge, um, like flash of lightning, it would be a, would cheer, and it was kind of cool. Um, anyhow, hope you guys had a good weekend. We're gonna start um, by finishing up what we did on uh, on Friday. Friday we looked at uh, web services, and we got to the point where. So we looked at, uh, let's see, MIME types. We looked at MIME types. Uh, these are the way that uh, the server communicates with the browser and, and, and vice versa. Um, what type of content is going to be delivered or what type of content the browser uh, would like. Um, we also have, let's see, error codes. Where are the error codes? Oh, there they are. Um, error codes, these are, um, or status codes. These are uh, codes that the server can respond uh, with to indicate whether the, the response is what you requested or something you didn't request, and if it's something you didn't request, why is it what? Uh, why is it not what you requested? Maybe um, you uh, you pass some bad parameters or something, and uh, it wants to indicate to you that your request was invalid um, by sending you an error code of 400. So those are the status messages that a, a web server program can respond with, and a web server program can be a program that we write as well, um, a program that uh, delivers. Data, for example. <clears throat> um, we talked about how to um, uh, output XML and talked about how to output JSON. Um, JSON, it, uh, it, it's, it's a much better idea to, to create a data structure, uh, a PHP data structure, and then just sort of run that through JSON encode and print that than it is to, to bother or try to manually uh, putting together all of the syntax, which is a, a huge pain. Okay, so um, we've got a, a few different web services um, from this class. Uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, we never really got to this books example here. Um, actually, no, sorry, we did get to the books example, but I want to uh, modify that slightly. Um, I'm going to use, uh, <coughs> let's see, we're going to edit this. We're going to Continue with that example. So we have this books program. Okay. So this is uh, the JavaScript in this HTML file is making an AJAX request to the books.json file. Books.json, this is a JSON file containing a JSON code for a, a few different books. Um, what I want to do is I want to instead make requests to a web service and provide the web service with a parameter. So our JavaScript code here, we're, um, we're loading books.json directly. I want to write a web service that will um, output the books um, either in JSON or um, possibly in XML. So we did something similar to that. We did that with um, did that with baby games. Yeah, let's uh, let's write a web service that will read this JSON real quick and then just output it. Um, and we'll output uh, only the, the categories that were requested from, uh, from the client. Um, and let's ac actually just go ahead and add like to the client here, let's say um, there's a select here um, whose options are categories. So these are the categories of books that we can request. Um, and let's see, the categories of books that exist are cooking, computers, children. So cooking, computers, children. And then we'll uh, just go ahead and add a button here to request that list. Get books. Wrap 
this all in a div. Um, and then we can just maybe add a header here. Here are the books in my store. Okay, our JavaScript is going to make a request. Instead to uh, books.json, we'll make a request to books.php. And um, instead of when the window loads, let's do it when we click get books. And when we click get books, we're going to um, figure out which category is selected and request that category from uh, the web service. So instead of doing this, oops, instead of doing this stuff here, let's do that when the button is clicked. So let's say uh, document .get element by ID uh, ID equals get books. Get books dot add event listener click get books and in get books we will make the Ajax request to books.php and we will add a parameter let's say the parameter is category equals and then we want to get the value of this select we want to we want to figure out what uh, what option is selected in order to do that we get the value attribute of it so bear cat equals document dot get element by id categories dot value that value is whatever whichever one is currently selected um, of course this is the sort of um, if, if I want to actually like capitalize these or something and I want to, you know, say something different like the cooking category or something, um, then I'm going to have to specify behind the scenes, I'm going to have to specify a different value for each of these. Value equals, and this is sort of the one that the, the, the program expects, cooking computers children. Um, okay, so we're going to get the value. Uh, this is the currently selected category. Let's say we'll add that to this uh, query string here. So we're going to be making a request to that URL. Inject books. When we inject the books into the page, Let's see, we're not going to be filtering here. Here what we were doing before is we were filtering uh, the, the JSON title, the, the books that we were getting from the JSON file um, to only display the ones with uh, the computer's category, but we're going to not do that anymore. We're going to show whatever the web service get, gets back, gives back to us. So bookstart.append. So um, this looks fine. We just now need to write our books.php. Um, books.php The goal of this will be to accept the category parameter. Category equals get category. Um, maybe if this parameter is not passed, then we'll display everything. Actually, why don't we uh, have an option for that? Maybe option value equals nothing, all categories. So if, uh, if the parameter is not passed or if the parameter is empty, so uh, we'll just sort of default to everything. Um, so maybe we'll, we'll have to say, we'll have to check to see whether this parameter is passed. If, uh, let's see, is set category and not empty get category um, so if the parameter is passed and it's not empty uh, let's say category is null and we'll say if 
that then category will be overridden by whatever's passed. Okay, so by default we'll have we'll, we will we'll, we'll not filter by category. We'll just output everything. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to load this JSON file. Um, we're going to be doing some interesting JSON manipulation here. We're going to be loading a JSON file into a PHP data structure. We're going to be iterating over that data structure, filtering it, uh, filtering the data out, and then we're going to be converting that PHP data structure back into uh, a JSON file. And we're going to be uh, outputting that to the browser. So we're going to load the JSON file. So let's say, um, let's see, um, data, we'll call it data, equals JSON decode. So JSON decode is um, how we convert a string into the decode. I believe so. JSON decode parses the given JSON data string and returns an actual data structure. So let's uh, let's decode the file. So we're going to have to open the file and get the contents of the file. So file get contents. File get contents of catag sorry books.json. Um, and I think there's actually an extra parameter that we sh we need to pass here. Um, so whenever you decode JSON, um, by default it decodes it as like an object, and so you have to use like the arrow uh, syntax for it. You can pass an additional uh, second parameter here, uh, a, a boolean flag that indicates you want it to be an associative array instead of an object. So let's do that. True, to indicate that we want an associative array. Okay, so we're loading books.json. We're um, parsing that as a data structure and returning that into data. Now data is an associative array containing uh, the entire data structure. So what we'll do is we'll um, for each over it data as um, book. So we know that books.json is an array of, of objects for each over them. And maybe we'll say like output equals array for each data as book. We can inspect the books category if book category equals category. Or um, so if, if we're not filtering by category, then we don't want to uh, we don't want to filter this out at all. So we're going to say if um, category and the book's category is equal to category. So if category is null, then we won't check. Oh, hang on. Category or there we go. Not category or. So if category is empty, or if the book's category matches, then we're going to add it to this output array. We're going to say um, array push output book. Um, let's let's just make sure I've got the the uh, the order of arguments here for array push correct. So let's see php.net array push array first, and then the value to push into it. Excellent. Okay. So now we have a list of the, the books that we're going to output. All we got to do now is print them. Print JSON encode output. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to need to indicate to the browser that we're sending the browser um, JSON um, as opposed to HTML. The default is HTML. So we're going to use the header content type application JSON. So this header indicates to the browser that we're, we're giving it JSON instead of, uh, instead of HTML. Yeah? Extra paren. There we go. Thank you. Excellent. OK, so books.html. Let's load books.php. 
So without anything, it's giving us this. So this is everything, right? Um, this output here is not particularly readable. Um, there are a couple different ways that I can, uh, I can format it a little bit easier. First, I can open up Firebug, and I can look at the net tab. We've done this. We did this on Friday. And I can look at the, uh, this request. Whichever request comes back with JSON data, I can go and click on the JSON tab here, and I can see um, each entry sort of nicely formatted in a table and so on. That's one thing I can do. The other thing I can do is I can go to some more there, there are sites that, that sort of uh, format JSON for you. Um, and also validate JSON as well. If you're outputting uh, JSON code and you're not really sure, um, maybe the browser is breaking or something and you're not really sure why, um, you might want to validate your JSON code. So let's look for a JSON validator. JSON lint, this is one of the most popular ones. If I paste in my JSON here, this is all on a single line, right? I can validate it, and as I validate, it will reformat it. It'll uh, pretty print it nicely for me. Okay, so it says that that is valid JSON. Excellent. Now let's go ahead and refresh this page. Um, let's hit get all categories. Maybe I'll look at the cooking category. Maybe I'll look at computers. Uh-oh, we've got a problem here. What's our problem? We're just, yeah, we're, we're appending to the list without deleting the existing stuff. So let's, um, when we inject books here, before we inject anything, let's remove all the, the pre-existing um, list items in that list, if there are any. So we can say ver. Um, li's equals document dot. Um, how, how should we get? How should we get these list items to remove them? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. So we could remove the, the UL and then just create a new UL. Um, I would prefer to remove the, the stuff inside the UL instead of just deleting the, the entire UL. So there are a couple different ways we can go about this. You can, like you said, it, it might take a while if we want to remove them all manually. Uh, but let's, let's, let's code this out first. So how would we get a list of all of the, the list items? Query selector. Query selector all, um, and then li. Why don't we look for the li's inside of uh, categories, just just in case. Category, oops, not categories. Uh, bookstore, bookstore li, and um, I can iterate over this list for var i equals zero i less than li's dot length by plus um, li's bracket i. So I'm looking at the ith list item. I want to get its parent node to remove the child. That is it. There we go. Remove it. OK. So that's one way of doing this. OK, that works. The other way of doing this, anybody know the other way of doing this? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's see. Let's get the UL. So document dot get element by ID bookstore dot inner HTML equals empty string. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Super nice, super clean, straightforward. Um, and of course, the browser takes care of removing all the DOM objects there. Um, this is, you know, this is this is sort of on the on the border between like assigning HTML and not. Um, 
normally we just use this to assign text to things, but you know, if you want to delete a bunch of stuff in one fell swoop, this is a pretty good way of doing it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, that's uh, that's all I wanted to do with this example. So um, we're basically just reading this JSON file um, into an array. We're creating a new array and adding each book to that new array um, if we uh, if it fits the category filter, and then we're outputting that uh, that entire thing as JSON. Okay, um, I want to move on to uh, some new material for today. Be getting into um, some more interesting stuff. Okay, um, <clears throat> so. When we visit websites like Amazon or Twitter or Facebook, um, periodically they ask us to log in. But um, oftentimes they don't ask us to log in for a really long time. Like maybe I might not visit Facebook for a month or something, and then it might ask me to log, in, log back in on my computer. But, uh, but for the most part, it just knows who I am every time I visit from that computer. Why is that? Like, why can I go back to this site and, you know, I, why can I go to Amazon and it can say, hello, Morgan Ducey. Um, why does it know who I am? I mean, it, it knows who I am no matter where I am. So it's not my IP address. You know, like my, my IP address changes every new internet connection I get for the most part. Um, how does it know who I am? Yeah. Yes. So, well, that's, that's the subject of today's lecture is uh, something called cookies. Um, so without um, the ability to store little pieces of information um, in the browser, there's no way that the server would be able to, um, to keep track of, of, uh, of who you are. Um, so a cookie is a little piece of information sent by the server to the browser. Um, you make a request to the server, the server responds by sending you a cookie. It says, here, hang on to this. Um, and when you make a new request to me at any time in the future, give me this back. So oftentimes what a cookie contains is something that allows you to either log in or authenticate or some sort of token that, um, that the server can use to look up who you are. Um, Basically, what a cookie is. Uh, so the, the term "cookie" from uh, is a shortened form of "magic cookie," which is a. Uh, uh, it's it sounds kind of funny, but it's an old networking term. It, it's used to mean something that I give to you that means something to me, but it doesn't mean anything to you. It's just like a little token that I give you, and you give it back to me anytime you make a, a new request. So I'm the server, you're the browser. I give you this thing, you give it back to me every time you make a subsequent request. I use that to, to keep track of who you are. Um, so that's what a cookie is. <clears throat> browser visits a page, the server sends a page with a cookie. Browser um, sends another page and it sent, uh, requests another page, it gives the cookie back on all subsequent requests. Um, cookies can be used um, as part of an overall malicious scheme if, if uh, uh, if, if they're misused, but they there are a few myths about cookies um, that I think for the most part these have been dispelled over the years, but they're not viruses, they can't do anything to your computer, they're not spyware, they can't steal your information. Um, there are pieces of spyware that could look at your cookies and steal information, but uh, cookies themselves are not spyware. They can't do anything to generate spam or pop-ups. Um, and they're not just used for advertising. They are they are very heavily used for advertising, but they're not just used for advertising. They store data. It's just a tiny little piece of data that the server gives you, and you, it just says, hang on to this. Tiny little piece of data, it just stores it, and then the browser knows that every time you make another request back to that server, it, it needs to give that cookie back to the server. Um, they're just a piece of information. It's not a program, cannot be cannot erase or read information from the user's computer because it's not a program. Fairly anonymous, although uh, the, the developer has to make sure that they're fairly anonymous. They can be used to track your viewing habits on a particular site. Yeah. So why, um, maybe like it's cheaper for them to like send you the cookie. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> That's been happening to me so much recently. It, it's kind of wigging me out, actually. Like, I, I see on Facebook the exact same thing I looked at the other day on another site. They're like, hey, come buy this. I'm like, seriously, you're creeping me out. Um, so uh, a, a tracking cookie, um, so in, in that particular instance, um, what's happening is uh, the site that you visited, like a shopping site of some sort, the site that you visited is communicating with Facebook and is saying, hey, you know, I, well, no, actually, so what they're doing is, um, so they know, um, Yeah, so they know based on a cookie that they put on your on your computer, uh, they, they know what your browsing history was at that site. And then when you visit Facebook, um, they're probably loading an iframe. It's a, a, a little trick that, that they can use to, um, to load their ad. And their ad has access to their own cookie that they stored on your computer. Even though it's inside of the Facebook page, they have access to their own cookie. Um, and they know right, from that point on they can generate an ad that's uh, dynamically generated for for you. Anyway, um, so so basically the way, the way the cookie works is I visit one site and I visit another site, and both of these sites use a um, a, 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 a common um, ad agency that populates the, their ad banner for for them. And this ad banner up here and this ad banner up here both come from lotofbanners.com. The way that they're injected into the page is um, uh, through the approach that I mentioned. It's usually called an iframe. It's just a little piece, an area in the page uh, where actually an entire new HTML document is loaded, possibly from a completely different web server. So this is just like a little window in the page where a completely new page is being loaded. Um, and oftentimes that, that page consists only of like an ad, only of like an image. Um, but that gets loaded from this third party website, this lotterbanners.com. Um, this, this advertising company, when you visit CIA.gov, because you because this uh, because this banner ad gets loaded from lotofbanners.com, lotofbanners.com can put a cookie on your computer when you visit site A. They also can read that, that same cookie when you visit site B. So they know you previously visited site A, now you're on site B, um, and they know that they know a little bit about your browsing history. They, they know that at least that you've been to these two websites. Um, so uh, that, this is pretty much the way that this works uh, with giving you dynamic ads in Facebook. Um, most browsers um, allow you to turn this off if you tell it to not accept third-party cookies. This is a third party. So if you visit CIA.gov and uh, you load material from a, a different website, from lotofbanners.com, then only CIA.gov is allowed to uh, place a cookie on your machine, not lotofbanners.com. And um, it's possible that uh, maybe just because I uh, I have, I, uh, on my new machine, maybe I, I forgot to configure it to, uh, to block third-party cookies. That, that just occurred to me. Anyhow, where are cookies stored? Cookies are actually stored very insecurely. Um, they're stored in a plain text file somewhere on your machine. Um, actually, in some browsers, it might not be a plain text file. It might be uh, like an XML file or it might be uh, some other type of binary file. But it's not very secure. Um, anybody gets access to your computer, they can just open up your cookies and... If a, if a bad developer has stored usernames and passwords in, your, in cookies, then somebody can open up your cookies and read your username and password. Um, in fact, you know you can do that right here and now. If you go up to uh, uh, into your browser preferences, and this is in Firefox, if you go to the privacy, um, you can look at individual cookies. So I'm gonna take a look at all the cookies that, that have been installed um, on in this browser. Um, I can look at like Twitter, Twitter, I don't know what it is with me I'm spelling during lecture. Um, so Twitter has uh, installed several different cookies here. Um, Amazon has installed several different cookies and some of them are ad cookies and so on. I can, uh, I can take a look at 
Well, let's go back to the Amazon one. Um, let's see, user ID looks like, session token. Um, well, at any rate, uh, what I can do is I can look inside the content of it. So this is the content of this cookie. This is a good cookie because it's complete gibberish. Um, this doesn't mean anything to me. It only means something to Amazon. If when I give this information to Amazon, it looks it up in a database um, internally that, um, uh, that, that tells it what, what this piece of information means. It means absolutely nothing to me. So if this is stored in a plain text file somewhere, this is a fairly, uh, fairly good cookie. Um, because nobody is going to be able to uh, to decipher it. <clears throat> yeah. The, the, the server that, that you're sending this cookie to has to be able to interpret it in some way. Um, and the server that you're sending this information to, maybe this is authentication information, maybe you're logging in with your username and password. If you're, lo if you're sending authentication information to them, they have to store your authentication information somewhere. Um, so they have to you know, store your password, uh, hopefully digested and with a good you know, salt and, and so on, with good security practices. Um, so they, they store your authentication information somewhere um, so that they know how, how to, so they can compare your login information to pre-existing login information. That has to happen. Um, but we don't have to store usernames and passwords on our computer. Um, and if somebody gets access to our computer, then hopefully they won't be able to, uh, to look at them. Um, there are some usernames and passwords stored on our computer. Obviously, uh, we all have login accounts for our own computers. Um, and uh, and our, our computers also store like um, you know Wi-Fi passwords and um, like auto autocomplete sometimes on forms and stuff. So our browsers do s store some of our usernames and passwords locally on the, on the machine, but it takes care of, of encrypting them nice and good. <coughs> Cookies, not so much. So how long does a cookie exist? Well, there are two different types of cookies. There is one that we call a, I, I would like to call this a temporary cookie rather than a session cookie, because session cookie will, will confuse you if uh, um, we're going to get into something completely different called sessions on Wednesday. So I, I, would like, I prefer to, to call this a temporary cookie. Um, a temporary cookie is only stored until the end of the browsing session. That's where the term session cookie comes from. When you close your browser, quit your browser completely, then the cookie just disappears, it goes away. The browser cleans it up um, in its sort of garbage collection um, and the, uh, the cookie disappears. Um, a persistent cookie is one that's stored uh, for, for a long period of time. A persistent cookie always has an expiration date. So if, uh, if you launch your browser sometime after the cookie's expiration date, the browser, you know, it, as soon as you try to use the cookie, the browser will notice that it's expired and will delete it. Um, so a persistent cookie will stick around for a while, but, it, but it's not indefinite. Um, temporary cookie is actually indefinite, um, but as soon as you close the browser, it'll go away. <coughs> so um, the way cookies work, um, so we, uh, on the PHP side, um, in, in in order to set a cookie, uh, we use the set cookie function. We specify the name of the cookie and its value. We're just storing a key value pair in the browser. That's all we're doing. Um, set cookie username Marte, age 19. Um, so what this does, this is exactly equivalent to, um, this is actually equivalent to a header. So there are, there's a header command that we could send. Header set cookie, um, let's see, username equals Marte, age equals 19. I believe this is a correct cookie string. Um, so the set cookie function, if we did these two set cookie calls, that, that would be equivalent to sending this header to the browser. 
So we talked about headers and how headers communicate information, additional information, uh, back and forth between the browser and the server. This is one thing that the server can send back to the browser to, to tell the browser, this is, these are some cookies that I want you to keep. So these are two different cookies, and I want you to hang on to these. Um, these particular cookies will be um, temporary cookie session cookies um, that will go away because they don't have any expiration date set. Um, you can set several different cookies. Um, each browser has different limits on the number of cookies you can set and uh, on, on the size of each cookie. Um, they're not intended to be places where you store a significant amount of data. That's, that's not something that you should be able to rely on. Um, if you want to store information, store a little token, a little piece of gibberish on, uh, on the, the client's machine. And when they send you back that piece of gibberish, you look that piece of gibberish up in a database and get all the large data that you've saved on, on, on the server. Um, <clears throat> so that's how we set a cookie. How we retrieve information from a cookie um, is we use, again, uh, a, a nice super global variable, under, dollar sign underscore cookie, and we uh, pass in the name and we get the value. So we can check to see if a cookie is set using is set. Um, and yeah, so in this case, we're saying if the username is set, then we'll uh, get the value of the username and we'll say welcome back. Otherwise, we'll say never heard of you. Um, and then these are all the cookies that, that we have. Okay. Um, again, so when we... Um, okay, so if you want to establish uh, an expiration date, actually, no, let's let's go write some code real quick. Um, so let's let's say. Um, We're just going to write a really quick little PHP script that will um, uh, that will tell us how many times we've visited this page, how many times we've refreshed this page. Um, so we'll say something like, um, "You visited n times," something like that. You visited this many times. In order to do this, so we're going to have to um, we're going to have to do two different things. So when we when we first load this page initially, the cookie will not exist, right? The client will not have sent us a cookie in the initial request. So if we do something like if is set dollar sign underscore cookie um, n this this will be false so we'll go into this else block here um, we can maybe say n equals zero you visited zero times Um, so if we go into this else block here, we're going to want to actually create the cookie, right? Um, but we're also going to want to say, so n equals cookie n. We're also, in either case, we're going to want to increment the number of times and save it back. So we're going to want to um, send a new cookie to the client that says this is the number of times that you've, uh, this is the new number of times that you've visited. So we're going to want to say set cookie um, n n plus one. Cookie, not Sam Cook. Um, Actually, why don't we, 
Let's do n plus plus. Let's plus n. That will make this n, um, say that you visit. So for the for the first time, that'll say that we visited once. Hello, you visited one times. Refresh two, refresh three, refresh four, and so on. We can go and take a look at this individual cookie. Um, remember that my web server, I'm running this on my local web server on my computer, and that web server, as far as the browser is concerned, is called localhost. So I can take a look at the, the cookies that have been installed here. Localhost, I have a cookie whose name is n and whose content is five. Um, we can do something else if we want. Um, let's let's say if is set cookie username. I'll just say name. Name equals cookie name. Else. Uh, we'll just say name equals null. So um, if the user has given us a name, then we'll want to say hello name. If they haven't given us a name, we're going to want to ask for their name. So maybe we'll say if, do some PHP code here, if is set, let's see, so we'll say if name, because we've set it to be null if, uh, if it wasn't provided. So if name that else Um, else we will say something like, hello, what's your name? Form, um, that will submit back to itself and we'll say, um, let's see, input type equals text, name equals name, value will be nothing. Submit. Submit name. So in this case what we're doing is we are um, we're providing a form, form to submit. The user will submit the form the form will submit back to this, this page. Let's make it a method equals post. The form will submit back to this page. And what we'll need to do is we'll need to say if uh, the request method, server request method is a post. Then we know that we've been given a name, and we're going to want to say set cookie name to be uh, post name. Um, There. Else. Okay. 
So if we've received a form submission with the name, then we're going to store that name in a cookie. Um, otherwise, we'll load the name from a cookie. Um, in either case, if, uh, if there's no name at all, then name will just default to null. So let's see how this works. Line five, parser, semicolon. Hello, what's your name? Submit name. Hello, Morgan. You visited seven times. Um, now if I refresh this page, it knows my name. Um, one thing I, I, I'd like to point out here is that, uh, so one thing that I had originally, I had this. I said set cookie to this, and I had this as well. So I set the cookie to the name that was supplied, and then I load the name cookie. But this won't work. For the one time after the, the, page, um, the page submission, let's go ahead and, and remove this cookie. So let's remove both of these, remote, remove. <coughs> Hello, what's your name? Morgan. So I submitted it, and it said, Hello, what's your name? Um, so the problem here is that I'm checking to see if the name exists. I if uh, If the... If the form was submitted, I, I don't set, I don't override name to be the supplied name. And the thing, the thing about this is I'm, when I set the cookie, the cookie doesn't become readable until the, the page is refreshed, until the next request. So when I do set cookie, that means at this request, give a cookie to the browser. When I, when I read the cookie, I check to see what, bra what cookies the browser has given me. When I set a cookie, I'm giving the, browser, the cookie to the browser, um, and, and that cookie will not be available to me until the browser makes a new request and sends that cookie back. So this will not allow me to get the name from the cookie that I just set. So that's why I adjusted it to this. If we um, if we've just done a form submission, we'll set name here, we'll set the cookie. We won't get the name from the cookie because that's not possible. Um, if we look at this request, we can see that, let's see, request headers. There was a cookie with an N of one, but there were no other cookies. And in the response, we have a set cookie uh, header with the name equals Morgan and equals two. So when we, in our PHP code, when we look at dollar cent underscore cookie, we have only access to n equals one. Uh, we don't have access to um, name equals Morgan, not until the next request. So make another request. Now it knows who I am. Um, anyhow, this, this fixed that. Um, <clears throat> If you want to make cookies expire, um, the easiest way to do that is to, uh, so we're, we're setting a name value pair here, um, just pass a third parameter that is sometime in the future. Um, if you want to get the current time, just call time, um, that's the PHP built-in time function, um, and then add a number of seconds that you want this to last. Um, so time, um, if you're familiar with the Unix, Unix time, this is a Unix epoch time. This is the number of seconds since January 1st, 1970. Um, and if you just add a week's worth of seconds to that, then it will expire a week from now. Um, you can add, uh, you can make it try to last as long as you want. Um, you can make it last a year or 10 years or whatever, but um, obviously practic for practical reasons, it's probably not going to last that long. Um, a couple of weeks is usually standard. A couple of weeks or a month is usually standard for, for cookies. Um, if we want to delete a cookie, 
Um, the best way to do that is to set a cookie just to, uh, to false, have its value just be false. Um, you can do that, or you can also uh, make it expire um, at a very early time, sometime before now. Actually, time minus one is probably not the best idea. You probably just want to say zero. Um, make it expire January 1st, 1970. Um, so uh, it, that'll account for any uh, differences in, in time between uh, the server and the browser. Chances are the server's time is not off by that far. Um, <clears throat> there are further attributes you can set. You can set um, the cookie to have sort of an expanded domain. So for example, um, google.com might set cookies that um, are restricted to uh, www.google.com, or they might set uh, they might, might set cookies that are restricted to like mail.google.com or um, uh, I guess if you think of like uh, UW, for example, Washington.edu uh, could set cookies that are available for just www.washington.edu or they might be accessible to www.cs.washington.edu, um, you know, ling.washington.edu, iSchool.edu. Washington.edu and so on. Um, so you can you can uh, you can add additional restrictions to the domain, or you can make um, the domain uh, be more accessible. Um, you can also specify uh, that it uh, it should only be accessible to a particular path on that uh, on that URL. So, for example, all of our stuff is stored on Webster. Um, if you want to make it so that your cookie um, is not is not usable by anybody else on your machine but you, um, the stuff that's in your web folder, then you can specify a path of your UWNet ID here um, so that only like uh, only requests to webster.cs.washington.edu slash your UWNet ID um, have access to that cookie. So that cookie will be uh, uh, restricted to your particular um, uh, folder on that, on that site. Um, Let's see, common cookie bugs. Yeah, so if you try to set a cookie and, uh, and retrieve the information from a cookie in the same session, in the same request, it won't work, just like we, just like we, like we saw. Because this sends the, the, the set cookie header, and then at the next page view, that cookie gets sent back to you, and then, then you have access to it. Um, uh, another important thing is that cookies, the cookie information, um, it doesn't actually need to, to, to precede um, all the HTML now, but it should uh, in order to be backward compatible. PHP is kind of smart about this now, but um, if you, uh, so all headers have to be sent to the browser before uh, any HTML content, before any of the content, the actual content of the page. Headers go first and then the content comes later. Um, if you try to to do some content and then you call set cookie, which in turn sets a header, um, then you've got a problem. Uh, but PHP actually, uh, I think it just sort of buffers this and it, it retains this and then it sends the cookie and then uh, it'll finally send all the, the output. Um, let's just check to see if that's the case. So we've got some set cookie stuff up here. Um, let's just move all of our, our stuff after the doc type. See what happens. Yeah, so PHP is okay with that. Um, it's being smart about that. On other systems, it might not be so smart, though. <clears throat> um, okay, um, that's uh, that's all the material I have for today. On Wednesday, we'll start looking at sessions. Um, I, I will also be posting the final exam, uh, practice final exam uh, information uh, later this evening. Um, final exam is a week from Thursday. Um, again, the, the format for final exam will be very similar to 142, 143. Uh, it'll be written. Um, you'll have two hours, two 60-minute sessions. The first session will be Thursday in lab. The second session will be Friday in lecture, so Friday in, in this lecture hall, Thursday during your re regular lab time. Um, and uh, there will be, 
the, the format will follow very closely the, the format of all the, the previous exam uh, uh, sample exams. So I'm going to be posting uh, several years worth of sample exams. I, I suggest you start uh, taking a look at those, you know, practicing them. Um, it's open book for the web programming step-by-step -step textbook, but it's uh, but everything else is 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 not allowed. So no notes, no computers, no um, uh, no other web programming books, no anything else. Uh, just just the textbook. Uh, for this course, so um, those are pretty much the details that you that you need. Um, any any other questions about the final exam? Yeah. Do you just get like the entire thing in one day? No, it'll be split up into two parts. Um, the The first part will yeah, you, you don't get to take home and and, uh, and do the second half at home. Um, the first part will be on on uh, on Thursday, and the second part will be on Friday. <laughs> and it'll be roughly uh, you know. Evenly, the, the difficulty will be evenly distributed, hopefully. So, all right, see you on Wednesday. You have a final on Wednesday? Yeah. Uh, I have a question about your form submission. So uh, you just submitted it via a basic post request. Is there a way to submit something as a cookie request? So as instead of going through the step where you went from a form to a post to a cookie, to go straight from a form to a cookie. Um, so could you inject PHP into there based off the value of the form? Like my point is, like take out the post. Step. In order to do that, you would have to um, you would have to use JavaScript. Ah. So you would have.